Welcome everybody. It is my pleasure to uh, welcome you to our first event of the fall 2021 CLAB Speaker Series, the Center for Latin American and Border Studies. My name is David Ortiz and I am the faculty fellow for CLABS and um, I am very excited to welcome you to this first event. Um, before we begin, I wanted to say a few things about our speaker series this uh, fall. We already have a great speaker series uh, lined up for you. This is our first event, um, but we also have two other events already lined up for you. As a reminder, uh, this speaker series uh, happens the last Wednesday of every month. Uh, in November, we won't do that. Uh, uh, because the last Wednesday of the month is actually during um, uh, Thanksgiving week. So we will do it one week earlier. Uh, but we have great speakers uh, for this uh, series. Um, we have um, different places where you can uh, go find the events. You can go to our website, which is class.nmsu.edu. And if you go to events, you can see there our speaker series and you can see all the events. You can also follow us on social media. And uh, if you do have access to uh, the, the chat, uh, we are putting those in the chat. If not, just uh, find us on Twitter. We're CLABS on Facebook, also Center for Latin American and Border Studies um, uh, at NMSU and uh, also on Instagram. Um, so please go uh, uh, to all of those uh, and follow us. The last way of kind of finding out about our events on this fall 2021 speaker series and on is to sign up for our mailing list. And uh, again, we're putting it in the chat in case you have access to it, but if you don't, it's fairly easy. Go to our CLAPS website and there is a little button there in our main page that says, if you're interested in joining our mailing list, um, please do. And then it's quite quickly, you just add your email, your name, and we will be sending you reminders of these events. Anyway, thank you so much. Our speaker today is actually uh, Dr. Tony Payan, and he's being, this, this talk is being co-sponsored by CBED, the Center for Economic Border Development here at NMSU. Uh, the center is uh, a fairly newly created center and um, we have the opportunity and the privilege of actually having with us uh, Dr. Chris Erickson, who is the director of the center. Um, I will say a little bit about CBED and I will say a little bit about uh, Dr. Erickson and then I'm actually going to ask Dr. Erickson to please introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Payan. So, CBED, this new initiative at uh, NMSU that, that is directed uh, by Dr. Erickson, is basically a center that tries to identify impediments to border business expansion and economic development and uh, bring to bear the resources of NMSU to help overcome those impediments. So it's not only a really exciting idea and a really exciting idea for a center that actually has community implications, but also a very needed center. So um, I'm very happy that we have here Dr. Chris Erickson, who is the director of the center. And Dr. Erickson is the Gary and Catherine T. Carruthers Endowed Chair in Economic Development at New Mexico State University. Um, he uh, works out of the business college. His research is in areas are in macroeconomics, money and banking, in Latin American economic development, in particular, of course, Mexico and the border. Uh, you, uh, Chris, are you still interim department head there? At I am still interim department head. I'm the permanent interim department head at this point. I, I've been doing it for five years and uh, I, I, I suspect my, my reign will come to an end July 1. Uh, that's the plan anyway, but for right now, I'm still the interim. Well, thank you so much for being with us here, Chris, and thank you for helping us sponsor uh, this uh, great speaker, and let's hope that we can have lots of co-sponsored uh, talks in the future. So I'll leave it up to you. Thank you. 
Well, I, I'm very pleased to be here, and, and thank you, David, for uh, inviting me uh, to introduce Tony Payan, who is uh, the Francois Edward uh, Dijarian Fellow for Mexico Studies and Director of the Center for the United States and Mexico at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. He's also a professor of social sciences at uh, Universidad Autónoma de uh, Ciudad Juarez, in Juarez. Um, and um, between 2001 and, 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 and 2015, uh, Tony was a professor of political science at uh, just up the road from us at UTEP. Uh, uh, Tony earned his BA in philosophy and classical language from the University of Dallas, an MBA from the University of Dallas Graduate School of Management, and he received a doctorate degree in international relations from Georgetown in 2001. Uh, Dr. Payan's research focuses primarily on border studies, particularly the U.S.-Mexico border. His uh, work centers largely on issues of borderlands as areas of hab habitation, including the various conditions that affect life and liminal spaces. This includes cross-border flows, both legal and illegal, of people and products, as well as border governance. He also researches problems affecting U.S.-Mexico relationship, uh, the U.S.-Mexico relationship. Uh, Dr. Payan has offered two books, Cop, Soldiers and Diplomats, and The Three U.S.-Mexico Border Wars, Drug, Immigration, and Homeland Security. He is uh, a co-author of a book that's forthcoming, tentatively titled in English, and Improvised War, Personal Stories and Public Policy in the War on Drugs During the Felipe Calderon uh, administration. Again, that's forthcoming. And he is also working on a book currently uh, tentatively titled in English, The State of Political Parties and the Future Democracy in Mexico. I, I find both of those uh, forthcoming book titles very uh, intriguing. I look forward to reading them. In addition, he has authored numerous book chapters, monographs, and journal articles. Uh, Tony serves on a number of boards, including the Camino Real Regional Mobility Authority in El Paso, Texas, the Plan Estratico uh, de Juarez, and uh, he is a member of the Greater Houston Partnership Immigration Task Force and the Mexico Energy Task Force. And he's previously served as the president of the Associated Borderland Studies in 2009 and 2010, and it's through the Borderland uh, Studies Association that I know, Tony, and I'm very happy to welcome. Thanks, Dr. Payan, and I, I turn the floor over to you. Uh, before, uh, I'm sorry, Tony, to interrupt. I was reminded by our uh, amazing GA, uh, Yvette Navarro, that I did not say how you could participate in this uh, uh, talk. So uh, before um, Tony begins, um, you have a button in the bottom of your Zoom uh, that says Q&A. If you are interested in asking questions of Dr. Uh, Payan, please uh, use that Q&A button at any point. We'll be monitoring um, all the Q questions that get posed. The ones that we can ask answer immediately, we will. The ones that are answerable later on, we will actually wait till the end to ask a host of questions to Dr. Payan. Um, so please, locate that Q&A button either at the bottom of your Zoom, or I think if you're using a Mac, it's at the top of your Zoom, um, and use it at any point when you have any question. We love to have questions, and I'm sure Dr. Payan will be happy to answer them. Um, sorry for the interruption. Tony, please. Thank you, uh, David. Um, I know my camera is a little bit blurry. It'll come into focus in a minute. I have an old computer and an old, uh, camera. Uh, let me uh, uh, first of all thank uh, uh, David and uh, and Chris for their invitation uh, to be here with you. Um, I'm. It's always a, a great pleasure to me to uh, speak uh, to uh, borderlanders. I consider myself a borderlander. Um, of course, I spent a lot of time at uh, uh, UTEP and uh, OACJ and I still do, uh, as uh, Chris mentioned, travel to, uh, to the Universidad de Ciudad Juárez, Universidad Autónoma de Ciudad Juárez, 
uh, to teach every other weekend, and uh, and we continue to research uh, issues um, that have to do with the border. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, just to update a little bit of what Chris mentioned, uh, the book on the war on drugs by President Calderon has come out finally, just, just a couple of months ago. Uh, so I need to update that. And, uh, and now we have another book on uh, governance on, uh, on North, in North America and Europe uh, that will be coming out of the University of Toronto Press as well uh, uh, in, uh, in collaboration with Andrea Noferini in Barcelona and, uh, and Dr., uh, Dr. Bruno Dupeyron from the University of Regina in Saskatchewan in, in Canada. So uh, let me uh, tell you that I, what, th what I'm gonna share with you today over the next 30 minutes comes out of this book. Um, you'll see the cover in a minute as well on the presentation as my camera comes into focus. Um, it usually takes a few minutes, but, uh, but the, uh, this is uh, one of the more recent uh, studies. Uh, we called on many different authors uh, to uh, discuss uh, governance uh, on the US-Mexico border, to discuss institutional development as governance and uh, is closely related, especially good governance is closely related to uh, institutional development. Good institutions make for better governance and better governance makes for increased uh, development opportunities. So that's the subject that I'll be addressing today. I'm going to share my screen. I have some slides to share with you. So I'll do that now. Uh, and uh, there it is. Uh, and so I'll, I'll just focus on this, on this, uh, uh, the slides for a minute. So the title of our conversation today is essentially govern our, governing our binational commons. I have to admit that the term binational commons was intriguing to me. Most of you probably know the literature on uh, the global commons and, uh, and, and the governance of the commons. Um, it's a literature that has a long tradition in political science. And uh, um, uh, I, I thought along with Kathy Stout, a colleague of mine at the University of Texas at El Paso, that uh, we ought to reconceive our border area as a global uh, or as a uh, binational commons rather, uh, a, a space that needs to be better governed. And so I'm gonna focus my remarks today on the very issue of figuring out how to govern our commons better. Um, so to, uh, uh, there it is. There's the uh, uh, cover of the book that I mentioned a minute ago where you will find uh, most of my remarks uh, in, um, it just came out uh, in uh, earlier this year. Uh, and uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, I hope you, those of you who can get it uh, uh, might uh, find it useful in your research in uh, border studies, particularly our uh, border uh, and uh, our region, uh, the Paso del Norte region, which includes Las Cruces. Uh, I, I think one of the, there's a couple of central questions that I wanna put on the table. I, I'm not going to necessarily answer the question comprehensively for you. I'm going to offer reflections, but I think those questions can guide our um, uh, understanding or the conversation today. Um, first of all, I, I wanna invite everyone to think about the border as a commons. Uh, a space that we share and we are responsible for, a space that we live in and is owned by all of us. It's very hard to do that because the logic of the nation state invites us to split, at a minimum, to split a certain territory, a commons, into, and to fragment it into different, uh, not just issues, but also territories. And so refragmenting refrag or reintegrating uh, rather uh, the, uh, uh, the, the space, the physical space that we live in and that we own together and that we inhabit together is a challenge. Uh, but if we don't do it, uh, I wanna make the case uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we are probably undermining uh, better governance and therefore 
uh, better economic development for all of us. So the, the first thing is how to reconceive the border as a commons. And the second is if we managed to reintegrate in our imagination and our creativity, the physical space that we inhabit, the borderlands as a commons, then how to establish effective governance, particularly because over the last 170 years, we have strived and sought to divide governance and to often set one system of governance against the other system of governance and often uh, quite in an adversarial way. And so the idea is how can we establish uh, effective uh, governance uh, first, as I said, reconceive the space as a commons, and second, how to, without necessarily uh, erasing the border, establish better governance uh, on, the, uh, on the territory and the different issues that affect us. And then the other question that I want you to think about is, what is the relationship between governance and prosperity or economic development or human welfare? I think they're intimately related, and there is a broad literature that comes from uh, the social sciences on the relationship between governance and especially good governance, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and, uh, and prosperity and economic development. And I think part of the reason why the border is poor, quote unquote poor, is because we uh, are missing a number of important opportunities that are taken away by the way we govern the border. So those are some of the central issues or questions that I wanna put on the table as we proceed in this conversation over the next uh, uh, 25 minutes. And then we, uh, you can ask me any questions you want. The, as, uh, in regards to the, um, in regard to the first question, I think, uh, let me define a commons for you, although many of you uh, may already be familiar with the word commons. It is a domain uh, that we own together. And uh, the sustainability of it is dependent on a rational use of all those who have access to it. That is not only the use of the space and the resources contained in the space, but also the ability to govern it in a way that is non-excludable. And that is that all of us can participate and share the resources and take responsibility as groups and as individuals for making sure that the space is preserved. I recommend if you really want to uh, understand uh, what I mean by this a little bit more, perhaps read Garrett uh, Hardin's The Tragedy of the Commons, but there's a very rich literature on the commons. And so I wanna invite you to think a little bit about the border space uh, not as a as two spaces uh, abutting each other, but but divided by a a sovereign line and also by a wall more recently, but rather a space where there is a limited number of resources of which we all share, uh, and and that we must somehow uh, uh, govern together if we want to preserve. Uh, those resources if we want them to be sustainable and then we want them to uh, uh, be the uh, or, you know be the 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 source or the fountain of prosperity for all of us um, of course the commons can be uh, you know in the literature the commons are taking many different meanings and and uh, uh, some of them have to do with the resources especially natural resources like forests fisheries water uh, fauna, flora, uh, all kinds of things. And we, you know, we're having great conversations today about uh, the impact uh, into the uh, fauna and the flora on the border because of the border wall, which tends to split um, these uh, straddling species with a very deep impact on their evolutionary path. So that uh, border wall clearly has an impact on the way that that even the natural resources uh, uh, are being uh, managed uh, in, the, in, in our space, in our borderlands. But the commons also involves uh, our infrastructure, the bridges and the roads and the police forces, public safety and security, our urban spaces, our uh, uh, the spaces that we share 
um, in the in the city and the region to explore and to and, and to live the outdoors uh, and the environment that we live in and share. Uh, that I think is um, uh, they're all uh, equally important uh, as um, as a natural environment. And then there is an additional uh, set of floating uh, uh, elements, I think, in the border space that we also share, and that I want to argue we are stronger uh, for uh, making rational use and expanding its, their use, and that has to do with knowledge, uh, technology, public health, culture and other uh, human domains. So think about all these different uh, 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 co different layers of our commons as needing or requiring better governance. And I think it's important to consider them all because all of them are present in our border space. Uh, one of the first things that I want to uh, uh, tell you is I, at the uh, Center for the US and Mexico, we've spent a lot of time uh, arguing about that space, the commons. What is this particular space? And over time, uh, we brought together all the different official definitions of the space, trying to find uh, a uh, correlation with the commons. What is the commons? What is the border commons? Where does it begin? Where does it end? How are we responsible for it? And we very quickly realized that there are many definitions of the border and the borderlands, depending on who you ask or what the issue at hand is. Uh, of course, the very broadest definition is the border states, uh, from California to Texas, and of course, from Baja California all the way to Tamaulipas. Uh, so that potentially could be uh, uh, the commons. And there are institutional structures that respond to that definition of the commons. For example, the Border Governors Conference, uh, which has not met since 2010, given some political buccaneering, uh, especially in places like Arizona and Texas. But uh, at the end of the day, I think that there is an understanding that the 10 states constitute a region, not unlike Cascadia, which involves uh, Alaska, British Columbia, Washington State, Oregon, and Northern California, uh, or the Pacific and uh, Canadian provinces or New England, which also share a lot of those layers that I just mentioned right before in terms of the physical space, in terms of the, uh, uh, in terms, uh, of the human domains and in terms of the built infrastructure. Uh, the, another one, of course, is the one that is used by the management of uh, natural resources such as water, uh, which have to do with La Paz agreements. And you can see there uh, the municipalities that uh, abut the borderline, and that can also be defined as the borderlands. That's in a, uh, those are the counties uh, that touch the border, and those are the counties and municipios in green. But there's also some adjacent counties uh, in uh, uh, purple that you can see there that are also considered as uh, counties and municipios uh, that belong to the borderlands. Even though some of them may reach deep into Mexico and deep into the United States, they're still considered uh, the border. And of course, the Border Patrol has its own definition, and that is 100 uh, uh, air miles, which is a straight line through the air, and that's 100 miles, and that can reach very deep within the United States and very deep, of course, into Mexico, if you think of it. And uh, there's also uh, the uh, BECC NAT Bank uh, definition, which is uh, uh, for some infrastructure projects, 62 uh, miles on either side of the border. Um, uh, later, uh, 100 kilometers, that is, but later in Mexico, uh, 300 kilometers were included in that border line uh, for these uh, funds that come out of the North American Development Bank, uh, different infrastructure projects that are meant to make up for the damage, uh, environmental damage, infrastructure uh, needs of the North American Free Trade Agreement back in the 1990s. And then Texas uh, also has taken advantage of some additional definitions within Texas 
And you can see some yellow counties uh, that are also defined as border counties. And the, the furthest of them uh, is in the very middle of the yellow strip. And it, that's Bear County in San Antonio. And you can see it right here, that where the arrow is, that is San Antonio. So for Texas purposes, San Antonio is considered a border town. But of course, that means that San Antonio or Bear County can actually access some of the Texas resources that are, uh, that are uh, allocated to border projects and border infrastructure and border public safety and security. So it is very difficult to define our commons. It depends on the issue. It depends on the state. It depends on the matter at hand. But even so, I think we have to try to ignore some of those issues that need to be further discussed and, and still manage uh, to figure out what uh, the commons means and how we can better manage it. And I often wonder if it is an absolute requirement to have a territorial definition of the commons uh, at all to govern the border better for everyone. Uh, that's a complicated relationship. And I think I leave it on the desk uh, on the table for, for us to discuss later if you want to. But for public policy and administrative issues, I don't think that we need a territorial, a single territorial definition that will cover all the many issues that we deal with at the, uh, at the border. I think it depends on the issue. It depends on the institutions, whether it's the NAD Bank, whether it's the IBWC, whether it's the Border Patrol, whether it's... Uh, 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 the uh, the different agencies that operate in the infrastructure along the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, so uh, what we do need to acknowledge is the, the, the border is a commons without necessarily uh, agreeing to a single territorial definition. What we do need to do, though, is to think of the border as a place of increasing complexity that demands better governance. My argument and our, the argument of most of the authors in this book is that the border is poorly governed. Uh, not only do you have to contend with the different territorial definitions of the border, you also have to contend with the different uh, issues that affect the border. For infrastructure purposes, uh, for, well, let's say for, for government, uh, uh, state government issues, Sacramento is important. Uh, to Austin is important, but for the IBWC, uh, the watersheds are important, and that means the Colorado watershed, which originates in Wyoming and Colorado, or for the uh, 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 the um, Rio Grande, which originates also in Colorado, and then goes down into the Rio Grande. So all kinds of issues uh, that expand and contract the territory. What we do know is that the border is increasingly complex. 15 million people, um, individuals live on the, on the US-Mexico border, just to, just to closer counties and municipios. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of trade activity, $700, trillion, uh, $700 billion a year. That is $1.4 trillion every two years. And uh, there is a lot of human activity, uh, cross-border activity, at some point before the pandemic, as many as 280 million crossings on the border uh, from trucks and trains uh, to uh, pedestrians, to vehicles. And there's of course security issues and immigration issues, commuter issues, infrastructure issues and so on. So it's a very complex border with many different layers and not really uh, the appropriate institutions. Uh, and we also have to consider that as, as uh, Sergio Peña from the Colegio La Frontera argues in the book, uh, that we, we have a sovereign line that is uh, 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 quite strong, a determinant of the way that we govern the border. We establish a sovereign line. And so there's practically two systems uh, joint at the hip uh, along the border and, and they operate on very different logics, historical logics, uh, public administration logics, um, uh, uh, public policy logics, and so on. And then, of course, you have all the social systems on top of it, uh, as I just mentioned. Uh, all the immigration systems, the, uh, you know, the, infra uh, the infrastructure systems uh, that operate uh, of all kinds, 
the water sharing system, um, the environmental systems or the natural systems, the knowledge and technological systems, the trade systems and so on. So you have all these above ground uh, uh, human activity that reach well uh, beyond the borderline in a diversity of issues. And then you have a structuration of governance, which has been very rigid, a federal government that is that, that, that bears heavily on the uh, structures of governance on the US-Mexico border through federal agencies, whether it be aduana in Mexico, whether it be uh, customs and border protection, including the border patrol and other agencies on the US-Mexico border. And they bear very heavily on the way things are administered and the way things are, uh, are managed along the border with uh, a lot less room for local and state perspectives. Uh, even though they try, uh, uh, the, the, the ability um, that they have, the power is not uh, devolved enough to local governments to be able to have a, an input on the way that we conduct public policy uh, and the way we give access to resources and the way that we maintain those resources for the sake of sustainability. Um, but I think, as I said, I think the border demands, the complexity of the border, the, the physical environment, the built infrastructure, and the other human domains, all of which are layered on top of each other on the border, constitute a network, not just a, a number of important uh, uh, actors from individual to corporations to government agencies, uh, to businesses uh, and on and on, uh, but also I think in the number of issues, but they also uh, constitute a network and we interact in very complex ways. So I think we need to introduce some of the literature of networks into understanding how the border is governed. Um, it's not enough to look at the different scaffolding, institutional scaffolding that has been formalized over time, for example, NAFTA or now USMCA or the IBWC or the government agencies and the way they, the different programs by which they operate and, and interact with each other. But we also need to think about the networks uh, that are, exist within the border on one side or the other, or the cross-border networks that also interact. But what is true is that there is a very complicated relationship. And I'm so glad that Eric uh, and Chris Erickson is here because I think Chris can help us uh, perhaps elucidate a little bit uh, the relationship between uh, governance, institutions, and economic development. And I think that in places where the institutions are underdeveloped or undeveloped, or they simply do not exist at all, then you have very difficult and, and, and um, complicated governance uh, that relies on personalities, on uh, individual political will and such, and therefore it stunts economic development and stunts human welfare. So what we need to do is think, very, think about these commons as a very complex place that requires institution building for better governance and ultimately for inclusion, democratic inclusion, and economic development or economic growth. And I'll say more about that in a minute. The real problem of the border, and this is where I begin to address the other question that I put before you a while ago is, uh, what is the real problem of the border? And we all know, because we live on the border, we work on the border and we travel throughout the border, the real problem is poverty. Um, the border is there and it is somehow governed, perhaps in a very autocratic way, because the Border Patrol has a lot of say. Uh, there's a lot of political buccaneering going on on the US-Mexico border. We saw it with uh, uh, the presence of Donald Trump and the way he intended to manage the border, um, even against the interests of borderlanders and even to the detriment of the physical space, the, 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 the ability of the uh, fauna and the flora to flourish in the Sonoran and the Chihuahuan Desert and beyond. Uh, that what we, the real problem is human welfare. In the border counties, uh, certainly in New Mexico and Texas, but in Arizona as well, 
a little bit less in San Diego, but but certainly in, in most of the border, uh, the counties and the municipios uh, that abut the border have very high levels of poverty. And even in Mexico, where the border is relatively prosperous, the reality is that there is a lot of urban poverty. And I want to suggest that part of that poverty is locked in. And it is locked in because of the way we govern the border, because, of, because we built institutions to exclude that create vulnerabilities and, and essentially erase, wipe out opportunities to use the border as a resource. We know that borderlanders are uh, uh, quite smart at using the border in different ways. I'll give you one instance. Poor people on the US side who do not have access to health insurance often travel across the border to access uh, uh, health care, eye care, dental care for a fraction of what, they, what it costs on the US side. That's hedging a differential. That's one of the smartest things that borderlanders do. And some of the maids of uh, El Paso, for example, who come, uh, some of the ladies who come to clean houses and take care of the elderly and children, they also understand that there is an opportunity to make money there. And the way we have responded to this level of integration is by uh, punitive measures, by exclusion that at the end of the day locks people into poverty because it wipes out opportunities that would be magnified by a better governance, one that allows borderlanders to tap into these differentials as a source of wealth to lift themselves out of poverty. So we have a problem, and I think it's not just a pro pro problem of poverty. We often think of poverty as an isolated issue. I think poverty is a direct consequence of the fact that we govern the border very poorly and we govern it in a punitive uh, direction to um, uh, essentially force people not to take advantage of the differentials. Not all, of course, uh, corporations do take advantage of the di differentials, for example, on the costs of labor. And they establish maquiladoras in Mexico and they make use of that labor and then they bring the, the finished products back into the United States. Corporations are able to make use because they have many more resources of these differentials and they know how to go around the system, get the right, the system to work for them. But most borderlanders don't have the advantage of these kinds of resources and time for strategic thinking uh, so that they can also use the border as a resource, locking them on one side or the other into a, a life of poverty. Uh, so what I want to do is establish kind of a theoretical relationship that we can discuss, and that has to do with uh, good, good governance and economic growth. As I mentioned, uh, this is not, by the way, an easy relationship to uh, sort out. Um, what is the relationship between good governance and economic growth or human prosperity or human welfare? It's a chicken and egg problem. Good institutions often produce inclusive, democratic, I'm talking about good governance, not just governance. Governance you know, can come even from an autocratic regime. I'm talking about democratic, uh, inclusive governance. Good governance, I think, is a sine qua non for economic growth. And at the same time, once there is economic growth, it can certainly uh, uh, complexify a space and force it to produce institutions for governance. And as people demand participation in governance, they magnify the potential for economic growth. So we have a, a chicken and egg problem. In the particular case of the border, though, I think with uh, more political will from our leadership, we could probably push for better structures of governance, institutional, a, a, a institutional scaffolding that might work better for all of us. Uh, we don't have that, uh, that kind of leadership on the border. I think we haven't had it for a very long time. And so we, it's very difficult for us to create that virtuous cycle or circle of good governance, economic growth or prosperity and human welfare. And then uh, that in turn creates demands for greater participation because it creates a middle class and greater wealth. So we kind of were trapped in a, in a cycle of poor governance and, and lack of opportunity. Uh, so uh, clearly, uh, as I just mentioned, we need to think about that relationship because on it depends where the border uh, will be in the future and what are the opportunities that borderlanders will eventually have. Uh, 
Well, the book uh, that I just mentioned, uh, we, you know, we explore many of these different issues and many more, by the way, there's a, a wealth of information in 400 pages in, in this book. But I, I wanted to tell you that one, some of the books address the issue of statistics. We often seem to be talking past each other and we don't even address the same issues in the same way. And often when we talk to each other, we don't even have the same data in mind. So I think one of the best one of the better ways to elicit uh, better governance on the border is essentially to figure out ways to collect better data and better statistics. And that is possible, by the way. I mean, the, the North American Free Trade Agreement, for example, forced Mexico and the United States to create the North American Industry Classification System, where they know and they understand by code uh, what are the different parts and components and things that go into manufacturing, and they can very easily count them and classify them and tax them and move them around relatively freely across the border. But on many other issues, like what is poverty, who participates, what the more human aspects of, of welfare and well-being, uh, we don't necessarily collect the same information. And I think we ought to make a push. And, and some of the uh, some of the authors make the case that we definitely need better uh, collection uh, information because it's also very difficult to compare one side to the other. The two countries seem to collect very different information in many different ways, and that ultimately is a base for, for what we need to do. Um, also, networks, I think, as I mentioned, we need to bring a kind of a network analysis to see how it works. But in, in our particular study, what we found is that the networks are actually weaker and getting weaker on the US-Mexico border. There used to be a wealth of networks, churches, clubs, uh, uh, families, uh, businesses that came and went more freely along the US-Mexico border. But over the last quarter of a century, these links have actually gotten weaker because there is greater control of the borderline and there's more punitive measures for individuals who choose to interact or even engage in activism in favor of the border and the, and the, the people that live on the border, borderlanders in general. Uh, and I suggest that federal agencies are more interested in closing networks that lead to less exchanges of information, of technology, of activism, and therefore democracy. Who benefits ultimately from deactivating networks across the border? To me, the problem with the way the borderline is managed is that agents uh, appear to think that the best border is a border that is not crossed at all, that is not used at all, and they seem to actively operate to deter uh, border crossing and interaction across uh, the borderline by different businesses, corporations, clubs, individuals, and so on. And they are quite punitive, and their their uh, uh, whole surveillance scaffolding has grown essentially to try to deactivate these networks. One of the arguments that I made recently, for example, is that they've taken advantage of all the external shocks to deter the use of the border by different people. And today we see the border is closed for Mexican citizens because of the COVID pandemic. And at some point it's going to be unsustainable to say that we in the United States have gotten hold of the COVID pandemic and still uh, be uh, um, preventing Mexican citizens from coming into the United States. You can't have you can't have it both ways. Use Title 42 to prevent people from coming in, to use the border as a resource, and at the same time say that we are past the pandemic. There is a contradiction in the way that we are managing the problem. To me, as I wrote in the Houston Chronicle some time ago, the border should have been open by, by the summer of this year. And yet they now uh, closed it through at least October 21st. And I suspect it'll remain closed almost for the rest of the year. Um, the local government interface, I think, is also one of the issues that we discussed, and uh, there's a low degree of autonomy. Um, and in fact, uh, some of the state governments and some of the, especially the federal government, have taken away uh, all the ability of local governments to 
uh, cooperate on different issues. I remember in 2010, I wrote a chapter on the collaboration between El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, and I found it very difficult because our goal was to essentially uh, bring the mayors and the city councils together to deal with local issues. And it was a very difficult thing to do. At that time, I was a member of the Cross-Border on uh, Relations Committee, and we tried to get them to meet, including Sunland Park, by the way. And uh, it was very, very difficult to do it. We managed to do it, but there was no substantive talk because the Open Meetings Act of Texas forbid the uh, a quorum to meet outside uh, the uh, you know the established protocols for public meetings and the same thing in what is so the rules themselves are such that they impede open conversation and collaboration because they literally forbid meetings outside the territory for both and when you cannot meet you obviously cannot deal with those issues and you also don't give the opportunity uh, for the creation of uh, interactive spaces where issues can be discussed and we can engage in a discursive democracy. So there is a democratic deficit to a large extent. I'll move ahead. Uh, there is also a chapter on environmental issues uh, and uh, this has been perhaps one of the most successful spaces. There are three river watersheds or three, three watersheds that the two countries share. The Tijuana River watershed, the uh, Rio Grande watershed, which we of course share in the Paso del Norte region. And of course the uh, Colorado uh, River watershed, which as I mentioned, originates all the way back in Wisconsin, Colorado, and comes down to Arizona, Nevada, California, and Sonora and Baja California. Um, the IBWC is one of the more successful organizations the argument that we make, however, is that, as we're seeing recently with the crisis at the Colorado River, uh, we're running out of water and the climate is changing and desertification is advancing very quickly in the western part of the United States and northern Mexico and, and other environmental issues that have shown up. And the mandate for the IB, IBWC has barely expanded. And so will these institutions uh, be sufficient to manage the complexity of climate change for the peoples of the border or will they eventually turn the border into a wasteland where people will eventually have to move away from because there simply is no water uh, to, um, to share. In other words, if we don't govern it well, we don't govern it for both. Uh, uh, and there, there's less of it, then we're going to face a situation in which the border will simply cease to grow and will cease to develop. There's, well, there will not be the resources to do that. So I think Stephen Mummy and Iracema Coronado do a really very good job at saying this has been a great governance space, but, it, but, but the changes have overcome the institutions or appear to be overcoming the institutions. And I think uh, we need to look ahead at the, at the challenges and perhaps readapt the institutions. That is, That takes a lot of work though, because the federal issues are very complicated and generally these things depend heavily on State Department, Secretaria de Relaciones Exteriores, CONAGUA and other agencies that have very little to do with the border and govern from afar. On health, what we've seen uh, even became more evident during the pandemic is a dismantling of the prior uh, uh, health infrastructure, cross-border health infrastructure. Uh, that some, some diseases, I think, gave rise to uh, some of that collaboration on health. Uh, I think tuberculosis uh, is a border disease, played a big part in that. They wanted to tackle that. And some institutions like BAHO were established in on the border to deal with this issue. And then eventually they were extinguished. I mean, it exists in Washington DC, but it does it no longer exists in the Paso del, del Norte region. The markets do some of that. They make up for the lack of institutions and collaboration. And you see it in medical tourism. I already spoke about that. But, the, but perhaps the pandemic ought to make us rethink the fact that we need collaboration so that we don't have to shut down the border and prevent people from using the border for their purposes, hopefully legal purposes. I mean, I'm not advocating for, you know, 
drug traffickers and such, but I'm talking about legitimate trade and travel individuals who have the right to use the border and can use the border for their purposes. Uh, I think that perhaps the pandemic will bring us back. I doubt it though, because I think uh, the, the, there's been an incredible deterioration on even, even statistical health, uh, uh, health statistics sharing uh, on the US-Mexico border. On security, this is the true dominant incumbent on security. And as I mentioned, they govern with a very specific mindset. And this is one of the issues that seems to have per, uh, pervade, uh, that, that's become pervasive and seems to have invaded all the other issues. Everything now is looked at through the lens of security, whether it's health, whether it's immigration, whether it is infrastructure, whether it is labor markets, everything has now become a security issue. And we have over securitized the border space. And of course, along the lines of American fears, prohibition, illegalization, exclusion, vulnerability, and repression. And this is the, the, the framework that currently um, prevails and along the US-Mexico border. I don't think that, despite the fact that there's been a lot of conversations on how to rebalance security and prosperity on the border, I think at the end of the day, security continues to prevail. And we leave much uh, uh, prosperity on the table for the sake of security. Why? Because the two countries haven't also find the right frameworks to secure the space in favor of borderlanders and in favor of their prosperity. They govern essentially back to back. And I've also written about security in this particular case. And I think that even though there are maybe many challengers, businesses, uh, civil society organizations, and even the voiceless who occasionally challenge uh, the, secu the securitization processes of the border, the reality is that the tr they are the true incumbents because they receive all the political support and all the resources from the federal government. Uh, on mobility and migration, uh, I, I don't want to really stop here. I think you, you know the evolution, but it has also evolved in the direction of uh, uh, criminalizing uh, individuals who take advantage of the labor markets, of penalizing individuals who work on one side without authorization, regardless of the, the demands of the market. And we have increasingly built the infrastructure to prevent human flows. I think there are better ways to manage that, whether it's a guest worker program, which existed between 42 and 64, whether it's a different way of integrating through TN visas and the, th the different things that already exist. Uh, that you know the, the, that may open opportunities for labor market integration is another thing. Uh, I think the TN visa, for example, which was created under NAFTA and preserved under the USMCA, might be its expansion and the expansion of the categories of individuals that may qualify may actually solve the labor shortage problems for the United States and the labor surplus problems for Mexico. But that's not the way we govern the border. So even though some mechanisms that could be potentially expandable to start a slow and orderly integration of labor markets are not being used effectively because the categories are too narrow. Um, Two more things uh, before I close. Uh, uh, there's a couple of other issues that we deal with on the, um, in the book and they have to do with infrastructure. Uh, I wanted to uh, tell you that this continues to be a very fragmented governance space. Some states like Cal California, I think have a, a better vision of the interconnectedness of this infrastructure with the uh, peninsula, the Baja Peninsula. Um, other places do not, but businesses do have a vision. And recently we saw the Canadian uh, and, uh, and Kansas companies, railroad companies acquire uh, uh, the rights to these rails that now go all the way from Lázaro Cárdenas and Coatzacoalcos uh, to the Canadian Pacific and, and, uh, and uh, Atlantic coasts, uh, through, including the Gulf of Mexico and the in the, uh, uh, the Midwest. And so clearly companies are seeing gr great opportunity in integration. Uh, but at the border though, they, what they face is a cost of transactions or a transaction cost because the border often, that's where they have to stop and get inspected and get, uh, and, and the, and the uh, 
the issue of security prevails. And this is one of the things that we need to deal with. You see it at the international bridges as well. Even El Paso, which made an effort to collect, increase the fees, pedestrian and vehicle fees, to try to expedite border crossing. And they gathered about one, they estimated $1.6 million for extra time for border agents to expedite the time. Hasn't really worked. I haven't seen yet a single study by the city of El Paso over what they're doing with that extra $1.6 million and how they have, how many they have saved each individual that has to sit at the border, sometimes for two, three or four hours. One of the untold stories that is also included in the, in the book is the energy integration. Slow and quiet, uh, but it's ongoing. Mexico's manufacturing industry is fueled by Texas gas, although there's also other energy uh, exchanges, uh, electricity in Baja California and California, for example, uh, gas has become a major issue between Texas and, and Mexico. And now there's all kinds of pipelines that are beginning to reach the coastlines uh, and that are taking advantage of the open markets, even though Mexico is currently in a, a state of regression when it comes to energy. I think President Lopez Obrador's efforts to stop energy integration are not going to succeed. I think that'll be the, uh, that'll be the, uh, you know, it's kind of a hiccup on the road, but I think uh, such integration and market forces and Mexico's own needs are not going to, uh, I think are eventually going to push through and, and they're not, you know, they're not going to stop simply because Mr. Lopez Obrador has a more nationalistic conception of energy integration. So to conclude and leave a few minutes for Q&A, uh, I think we have to consider a the complexity of our commons, uh, of our commons. There's multiple actors, multiple interests, multiple uh, uh, interests, uh, and multiple actors, uh, and, and, and multiple issues. Uh, actors, interests, and issues. I think uh, uh, the, the current development by accretion uh, going back and forth at multiple speeds is not going to be sufficient to unleash the economic potential of the border. On the contrary, I think it's being smothered and drowned out by the way we govern the border, particularly by the power of the incumbents, which is the security agencies. The current logic of illegalization of uh, punitive measures for borderlanders who cross and use the border, I think it's unsustainable in the long term, and it's also going to make us poorer for it. Uh, and I think there's been a failure of leadership because I think the uh, border, borderlanders uh, their leaders have not been able to advocate effectively for the region. So there is an incredible democratic deficit because ultimately we are not asked by our own leaders what kind of border we want, and they are not able to take that further up the ladder of power and advocate for additional uh, institutional and political resources to govern the border better. I'm going to stop there because I think I've already, uh, I've already uh, uh, taken... Uh, I don't know, 45 minutes, 50, almost 50 minutes, but we do have, I think, 15 minutes for Q&A, so I'm open to it. I think David will probably be moderating, or Chris, I'm not sure, but I'm happy, happy to do it. Thank you so much for a, a, a really thought-provoking um, presentation, Tony. Um, you know, it, it made me think, and, and, and this is one of the questions that actually has been posed. Yep. Um, it, it, you know, it, the idea of thinking of the border as a commons, right? Um, it, 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 it makes perfect sense uh, to us that, that uh, probably even to many people that don't live in the border, right? Uh, <laughs> um, and, and, you know, just thinking about the recent waves of immigration from um, Central America, right? Where there's a clear climate change, environmental crisis, uh, coupled with a political crisis that then, you know, drives large amounts of people to Mexico and, and then to the border. Um, it, it, I wonder, right, if in your discussions of these um, binational commons, uh, you know, does, does the border ever extend to, you know, is this like a more than a binational commons, right? Is this more of a, a continental issue uh, a, a, and or a semi-global uh, issue? Um, 
I'll relate that question. That is my own particular question, but I'll relate that question to another one that was asked. Mm -hmm. uh, two other ones that were asked, actually. Um, one of them is related to this. So in, in, in which ways then is the Mexico-US border different to other borders, right? Uh, 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 but also, you know, what is the relationship between the migration issue, the current migration issue to uh, these notions of both networks that, that you're thinking of, of, of figuring out um, how to think of the border and the commons as a network. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me say something about that. Uh, obviously very extensive questions, uh, not enough time to have a discussion, perhaps another panel in the future. But here's a, here's a, uh, you're absolutely right. And this is why in the beginning, I did not want to, even though I presented a map that Pam Cruz and I put together about the different definitions of the border and the territory. One of the things that we wanted to do is whether defining the border is a prerequisite for good governance. Uh, generally, you know, we govern specific spaces that are kind of border, whether it's a municipality, a county, a state, a, 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 gov a country, uh, or a region, a department, different denominations for it. Um, and I, at the end of the day, after much discussion, we decided, no, it's not, you know, um, let's, not, let's not fall into what some border scho scholars call the territorial trap. Uh, because it's a trap. Uh, the, you know, the, clearly some issues require different territorial definitions. Uh, so what, one of the things that has happened in border studies is that we have escaped, I think, theoretically speaking, the territorial trap. And now we see some issues as more regional. And I think uh, uh, you saw that the issue of infrastructure in North America, for example, reaches the entire continent. Uh, the issue of gas uh, is very important to Mexico and Texas, for example, but let's say not so much to Dakota or Kansas or Alabama. But the issue of uh, uh, immigration, particularly irregular migration, well, it involves Central America. Uh, but the issue of water, it involves the whole Southwest and Northern Mexico. So it depends on the issue. I think that, and this is why, we have to think about the commons as a flexible category, not through the territorial trap, but as an issue that we have to manage the cross-border cross issues in a better way as if they were a commons. And by commons, more than a, a specific territorial definition of the commons, well, we have to think of it as a commons because we own them together and we have to manage them together for sustainability. And that depends on the issue. Where you set the, the, the chain of governance or, uh, it depends on the issue itself. Uh, it, requires, it requires us to think very flexibly, but if we do not, then we'll fall into the territorial trap. And then uh, the issues of irregular migration will hit us and we will not even know because we're not thinking beyond uh, uh, border towns and cities. Uh, you know, and so I think this is one of the things that Kamala Harris and Biden are doing well, which is thinking regionally about immigration, but of course that requires a lot of patience, political will, uh, and the ability to form consensuses to deal with development elsewhere because ultimately it ends on the border. So in that sense, I think that's important. With regards to the um, uh, how different is it? Well, it depends, right? I mean, those of us who study borders worldwide realize, for example, that Israel and Palestine have also engaged in, a, in an over-securitization of their border uh, in, a, in a system that penalizes people who use the border and deters the turns of uh, border use, which is something that we share in common. And I think particularly US agencies are increasingly engaged in policies of deterrence. And, not, and I'm not just talking about deterrence of irregular immigrants. They don't want you or me to cross the border. They hate it. And, and you know, they, 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 they subject us to almost humiliative or humi uh, you know, humiliating uh, treatment. Uh, I mean, they, they really are uh, you know, in some ways uh, quite harsh with people who cross every day and they often question them and bring them into El Cuartito. You know, they take people back in and they, you know, they practically strip them and, uh, uh, you know, strip search them and do all kinds of things like that. It's a very humiliating experience in many ways to use the border. So some places, yes, but look, in Europe, they understood 
that one of the prerequisites for erasing the scars of borders and enticing people to erase the border themselves at the local level led them to create not just the border regions, Euro, uh, Euro regions, uh, in which different entities participated all along the different borders of Europe, but they also it also led them to create um, uh, specific purses for projects. And so in, uh, in the border between France and Spain, for example, there is a hospital built with European funds that services both towns. And so it's right up against the borderline and it's a hospital that services both communities because it was incentivized to be built with, and the two communities saw the opportunity to apply for the funds and build a hospital for both. Um, there's other places where they built infrastructure to bridge rivers. There's other places like in Germany and Poland where they actually built uh, two campuses uh, connected on either side of the river, connected by a bridge. And the students take classes on either in Germany or in Poland, and all they have to do is go from one building to the other with their backpacks over the, over the bridge and the river. So the European Union created the institutions and the incentives to slowly begin to integrate. We haven't done that. We're actually engaged in the opposite, how to deter, build, separate, uh, construct physical barriers and deter people from using the border. So it'll be a long way. And I think we have to, our studies, I think, have to um, sh uh, show, the, uh, uh, I guess, uh, shed light uh, and, uh, and really bring into question uh, the way we manage the border. Because my fundamental hypothesis that I presented to you was that we are leaving a lot of prosperity and, and shared uh, uh, human well-being on the table because of the way we manage the border. The border is a resource and we don't let people use it as such. Uh, by the way, criminals do. They manage to do it. They do it. Um, you know, drugs don't, don't stop. And so, you know, in the, in the name of going after terrorists and criminals, uh, we are really punishing legitimate uh, and legal trade and travel uh, and then uh, uh, not allowing the flourishing of additional opportunities, i.e. for the ladies who want to come and work. You know, we should have a visa for people so that we have slowly more integrated labor markets. We don't, you know, we don't want to do that. We did at some point. We just don't today. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Um, you know, related to this, I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump a couple of other questions, get to, to them later. We actually have a lot of questions. Yeah. Uh, but related to this institutional building, Lucinda Vargas, that uh, is a postdoctoral fellow at Seabed mm -hmm. and uh, actually coincided with you uh, at some point uh, when she was a director of Plan Estratégico de Juárez and yeah. you served in the governance oh, project. Back, back in the, yeah, back in the good days, yeah. Back, back then, she's, she basically asks, um, uh, how important is it for Mexico as a country, not just its border region, but as a country to achieve better governance since the country does suffer from overall weak institutions that are kind of derailing the country's, the country's growth and developmental potential. Um, and she makes the, the annotation that basic rule of law and accountability absent in many areas, rampant impunity, et cetera, do not make for a framework for Mexico as a country, border included, to grow and development. So how important it is, you know, you were basically talking about, we need to create this common institutions, right? And strengthen them. So how do we do this when Mexico suffers from weak institutions to begin with as a country? Yeah, there's a couple of things that I wanna say that. I wanna, I wanna refer to economics and security in answering that question. I think it might apply to other areas, but one of, the, uh, one of them is um, uh, Mexico, uh, has weak institutions and weak rule of law, true. But what is the definition of weakness and robustness when we talk about institutions? And how do we build institutions? Well, uh, in the case of, of the North American Free Trade Agreement, the, the conclusion of that particular accord was a way by which Mexico legislated itself from outside by committing to a market economy and by committing to respecting investment, foreign investment and such, it really paid off. I mean, Mexico at the end of the day, perhaps it didn't prosper as much, perhaps it produced a lot of wealth and it wasn't distributed right. So there were some, some issues that later Lopez Obrador took advantage of. 
and, and, and of course he was a critic of NAFTA, as was Trump. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think it was a way uh, for the Mexican economy to institutionalize itself under a market logic and, uh, and strengthen manufacturing and diversify the Mexican economy. Mexicans have also proven to be quite adept at forming institutions when the conditions are right, there's political will and the right leadership is in place. The Bank of Mexico is one example. It operates and functions very well. And of course, the crown of all institutions perhaps is INE, an Instituto Nacional Electoral, which runs the elections even against constant attacks. So when it comes to you know, the, the market-driven economy when it comes to uh, monetary policy and when it comes to elections, Mexicans have proven very adept and very good at uh, building institutions, uh, very functional institutions in many ways. So I would qualify that a little bit. Uh, the, the one area where Mexico has not built good institutions because it's been, it has been used to um, as a political football uh, is security, public safety and security. That is where Mexico is. So if Mexico can reproduce what it did on monetary policy, on market economics, and on elections in the field of security, the country would be much better. Now, the problem of not doing that with as much uh, is security is a concern of the United States, much of it real, but some of it imagined, uh, then clearly uh, that gives agencies in the United States an excuse to maintain their hegemony over border governance because they, they are very successful as we see with Abbott, the governor in Texas, for example, are portraying in Trump and in, in his, uh, you know, a lot of politicians engaged in that. Uh, they, they successfully portray the border as a threat, a lawless, uh, disorderly, uh, uh, chaotic space full of invaders that threatens the very essence of America. And as long as Mexico doesn't do that, well, then, yeah, that's going to be a problem. But I, I don't think it's impossible. It's just that Mexico hasn't gotten there to ensure that, there, that, you know, that the rule of law in all its different the, you know, day-to-day -day justice, the, you know, eliminating the, the structure of privileges that Mexico has and the system, which is part of the system of corruption. And then of course, the autonomy of uh, rule of law institutions from the Fiscalia General all the way down to prosecutors and such, if they don't strengthen them and, and make them autonomous of political power, then that, that's gonna continue to happen. If you look at NAFTA, if you look at the Bank of Mexico, if you look at INE, the reason why they're successful is because they were relatively protected shell, uh, 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 I guess, uh, um, uh, pr protected from political from political buccaneering. The problem with the, with security is that it hasn't gotten to that point. I hope that this president is not going to do it. So the next three years is going to be a nightmare. Uh, but but I think hopefully the next president will realize that such successful stories of institutionalization should be reproduced on the issue of security to remove the excuse from US agencies to stop treating the border the way they do. Thank you. I have, um, we're, we're reaching our time, but I have yep. two more questions. I think we have time yep. for two more questions. Um, Stephanie Arnett asks, could you please speak a bit about what you think uh, the long-term economic impact of COVID will be in the border region? and how that might vary across some of our larger land border crossings like El Paso versus San Diego, for example, okay. uh, and how might institutions aid in recovery once free movement across the border starts again? Tell me the second question again. I can't, I don't get the sense of it. How might institutions aid in recovery once free movement across the border resumes? Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, obviously there's going to be a setback. If you look at the line of uh, economic growth and uh, and prosperity and such, I, again, we have a major weakness, which is we're not, our economic institutions are not as inclusive and as fair or just to all. I mean, the problem, I think much of the political buccaneering that I spoke about goes on because a lot of people are left out. This is what people talk about when they say neoliberal politics or neoliberal economics, right? That a lot of people are excluded from that. And I think that's a failure of public policy and a failure of government. But obviously, if you look at the line as it climbed up the, the, you know, the graph, it obviously, COVID obviously brought it down. It was like a sharp drop. Um, we lost uh, time. Uh, but I think eventually, you know, the, the, there'll be a slight recovery. Uh, uh, 
and uh, and eventually will catch up. In, in the case of Mexico, for example, it'll take a little longer, uh, and that's the case in in um, uh, throughout the country, although not in every sector. And I'll say that in a minute. Uh, I'll say something about that in a minute. Um, Mexico's econo economy was already slowing down in 2018. Well, 2019, really, when President Lopez Obrador came into office, December 2018. Uh, and uh, so it slowed down. It went down 1%. And then in 2020, it went down by 8.5%. So the Mexican economy went into 2021 almost 10% smaller than it was in 2018. Now, that's going to take a while, because even if the economy recovers this year, um, at six uh, percent, which some people are beginning to say it's going to be more like three or four percent, it may take the entire sexenio just to get back to 2018. So, in the case of Mexico, the market will be weaker, uh, consumption will be weaker, and such. But Mexico heavily depends on the United States, and if the U.S. economy recovers, however, and consumption resumes, Mexico is one of the major suppliers into the United States, and that may help Mexico's recovery. We saw it with the remittances, for example, when the, uh, I, I, again, this is a, a hypothesis more than a, than a statement. If you think about remittances, when the checks the U.S. government gave uh, American residents and, and citizens, uh, you know, to aid their economy, uh, uh, you know, $1,200, $1,000, whatever, remittances in Mexico went up, which means that relatives, Mexican relatives were sending money to Mexico at record levels. Um, so it's a it's a bump in the road. It'll set you back in time, but not necessarily in the trajectory. Um, it, it, in the case of Mexico, there are some other issues that I think need to be uh, addressed, which is the the uh, um, the environment, the business environment is very hostile at this point. So Mexico may see some lost opportunities. But for the Paso del Norte region, I think if consumption in the United States resumes and economic activity in the US resumes and the United States resumes it, or, or the, the packages pass on human infrastructure and infrastructure investment, uh, then Mexico will become a major supply and will recover. And I think it'll it'll be good for the Paso del Norte region. There'll be an impact in the Paso del Norte region because there's manufacturing, there's logistics, there's services, there's warehousing, there's all kinds of issues that happen in the region. So I, I suspect that as the US recovers, it'll pull Mexico, even though Mexico will always be a little bit behind. So uh, it's a loss of time, but not necessarily uh, in the long run, a complete loss of the uh, of the trajectory we were on. We have to get back on it. Perfect. Um, uh, one, one last question. Of yeah. the 700 billion trade revenues that you mentioned, uh, did that include illegal drop trade? Uh, if it didn't, then that's fine. But the question really is, how does the revenue from that drop trade play within the commons? Yeah, well, uh, the no, I don't think so. I don't think I don't think that in the 700 billion, the 700 billion figure uh, comes directly from the U.S. agency on trade statistics, the Bureau of, of uh, uh, Statistics in the US uh, uh, publishes by month and by year uh, the different uh, goods services traded between the United States and different countries. And that is the number for the US and Mexico. These numbers are very accurate, but these numbers obviously are what is measured. Drugs are not measured. And so, and the value of them varies, right? I mean, everybody has a different interest in uh, estimating or underestimating the value of drugs. For example, you know, the Border Patrol or the CBP may have an, you know, they may catch a kilogram of fentanyl coming in and they may say, look, this costs $1 million. And then the tra drug traffickers may say, well, no, actually that was more like $300,000. Well, you know, because they wanna show results, they have an incentive to inflate the, the price of the drugs. They, or they may use the street price as opposed to the border price because that goes up in price as it moves along the chain. So, it, you know, you have to, you know, to examine the whole thing. So in that sense, uh, but I don't think it includes the, uh, the uh, uh, trade. Now, in regards to the, to the uh, border, uh, let me tell you, uh, in Texas, for example, I always tell them that Texas is two thirds of binational trade. Um, New Mexico is considerably less, but Texas is a juggernaut. Um, two thirds of these 700 billion originate in Texas, end in Texas or transit through Texas. All of this trade 
makes it through um, 40% through Laredo, Nuevo Laredo, 20% through El Paso, part of which goes east and some of it goes up through Las Cruces and then west and north and, and then 20% uh, um, in Tijuana and the rest the, other, the rest is spread around, uh, along the, the, uh, the border, the other 20%. So um, that means a lot of jobs. It means a lot of infrastructure uh, uh, needs, a lot of uh, transportation, a lot of warehousing, uh, uh, you know, even even the uh, the uh, drainage uh, system that exists in the Juarez El Paso region, and it means a lot of uh, uh, goods. And so, to me, that you know, the, the border has a, those 700 billion impact the border directly. 20% of them straight through El Paso, Juarez, El Paso, Las Cruces. Well, thank you so much. We went a little over, but we had too too many questions. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Tony, for a really engaging and thought-provoking uh, talk. Uh, let's hope we can have you at some point again, whether uh, by yourself or in a panel. Um, uh, I'm sure that everyone in uh, our audience appreciated uh, the, the, the ideas that you brought us and left them with things to think about. So maybe we will do this again. Yeah. Um, I want to thank uh, all of you for attending uh, the presentation today. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to Chris Erickson and to Seabed for co-sponsoring this talk. Again, my name is David Ortiz, and I am the faculty fellow for the Center for Latin American and Border Studies. Um, please join us in our next event um, that will be in October. Uh, hope to see you there. <laughs>